next speaker. I'm glad to see Perry Marshall. He will be talking to us about why the Bible makes no sense until you understand evolution. My name is Perry Marshall. I'm from Chicago. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I want to talk to you about a, uh, a way of understanding evolution in the Bible that I think make both of, make more sense. And I would like to suggest to you that when you take agency in evolution seriously, when you take it as a teleological phenomenon, the Old Testament suddenly makes a lot more sense. And so what always comes up is the question of evil and suffering and injustice. Why the genocides in the book of, of Joshua and the terrible judgments against Israel? Uh, why is the Old Testament Bible God uh, so mean and nasty? Uh, why not only human suffering, but also animal suffering? And here's the real question. The real question is, where did we get the idea that there's anything wrong with any of this? I think that's a very important question. So the uh, Declaration of Independence says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And there's a very, very interesting book by Alexis de Tocqueville called Democracy in America from 1835. And Tocqueville traces the idea of equality. Uh, and he, he asked the question, where did this idea in the Declaration of Independence come from? And he points out that every major event in Europe from 1100 AD onward created more equality, whether it was intended to or not. The invention of the gun, the invention of the horseshoe, the Magna Carta, the invention of the post office, the invention of the printing press. And he says, where did this equality idea come from? And he goes back in history and he lands on Galatians 3.28. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. All of you are one in Christ Jesus. He says the notion of equality comes from that verse. And before that verse was written, the idea of equality simply did not exist in the ancient world. Nobody considered everybody equal. That, that idea would have been considered ludicrous. And even now, in our scientific quantified age, there is no measurable objective fact that would establish us being equal to each other. If, if we start measuring stuff, we're all different, as anybody watching the Olympics can see. Um, before Christ, man related to God on what we might call Darwinian terms. And the Sermon on the Mount was the original counter-Darwinian manifesto. And so I wanna introduce a, a couple of concepts. Evolution alpha uh, in red here is Darwinian evolution. It's uh, now I'll I'll go into more about what I mean specifically about evolution, but we can all understand is is competition. Evolution omega is agape love, and I want to contrast these two. In evolution alpha, the first will be first and the last will be last. But in omega, in agape, the first will be last and the last will be first. Uh, meritocracy competition, fight to the death versus love. Cooperation for mutual benefit versus giving without expectation of receiving. Tribal versus universal. This life versus afterlife. Inequality versus equality. The Ten Commandments and law versus Sermon on the Mount, which is grace. Natural selection versus resurrection. And these are opposite end of, of extremes. And so I don't know how all you grew up. I grew up in a traditional, I, what I call a traditional view where the belief was that Adam was the first human. I would like to suggest that Adam was a real person, but he was the first prophet. And I will get to that more in a minute. Um, the traditional view says sin is transmitted genetically. 
um, I suggest it's actually transmitted by knowledge the same way that salvation is. Instantaneous acts of creation versus an evolving creation. Perfection at the beginning versus a process at the beginning. Paradise at the beginning versus, I would like to suggest that there is conflict baked into the universe from the word go, as exemplified by the, the presence of a serpent in the garden. Uh, God being intimately involved in everything versus God not revealing himself until he reveals himself to man. And a fall being physical death versus a fall being spiritual death. Uh, and I'll get to this in a second. Law in Romans 5 is usually interpreted as the Mosaic law. I would like to suggest that it's Adam's law um, in the Garden of Eden. So let's talk about this question of, of evil and suffering or theodicy. If you ask most Christian apologists, why is there evil and suffering in the world? They will say, well, you have to have those things for free will and love to exist. And I agree. I think that's entirely correct. But the issue is a billion times larger than that because choice is simple. Yes, choice is essential for love to even exist, but we have to acknowledge what we find in biology. I have referenced four different papers which further reference a hundred years of literature um, showing that all living cells are cognitive. Um, everything down to the cellular level exhibits cognition. And so cognition is the reason that we have evolution in the first place. And up here on the screen, I have two books, um, The Selfish Gene by Richard Dawkins, uh, my own book, Evolution 2.0, and very similar views are expressed by other uh, books, which I'll reference later. Um, Evol biological evolution experimentally uh, and empirically is not blind. It is cognitive. It's not purposeless. It is purposeful, as Dennis Lamoureux said earlier. It's not selfish genes. It's symbiotic relationships. It's not random mutations. It's natural genetic engineering. It's not junk DNA. It's epigenetics in similar mechanisms. It's not chance and selection, it's cooperation. It's not happy chemical accidents, it's cellular communication. It's not blind, pitiless indifference, but it is red in tooth and claw. I think Darwin was right about that. Uh, and so you have people like Dawkins and Dennett and Weissman versus people like Lamarck, McClintock, and Margulis. And there's a reference at the bottom of the screen if you want to. Uh, have a better comparison. Um, and so you have Richard Dawkins saying, the universe is exactly what you'd expect if there was no design, no purpose, no evil, no good. Well, that's the narrative he lives in. Uh, I suggest to you that uh, biological evolution works on the same principles as art, economics, engineering, business, politics, sports, and media. There's winners and there's losers and there, there's intentional competition. So, there's a very interesting concept. I'm sure most of us have heard people say things like, a truly evolved society would provide affordable health care for even its poorest citizens. Well, let's just point out that they use the word evolved, but this is a completely different kind of evolution than anything Darwin was writing about. This is what I am calling evolution omega. Now, modern people have embraced these ideas of equality and they're part of our culture, and they cause us to judge the Old Testament by New Testament standards without realizing it. So let's talk about Adam for a second. I think Adam was a real person. Uh, there is a very interesting book by Richard Fisher, who's a ASA member, called Historical Genesis from Adam to Abraham. And he shows that uh, there's good reason to believe that Adam was actually referred to in other Sumerian literature, and not just the Bible. And, and I believe that Adam was not the first human. I think there were other humans around. 
when Cain killed Abel, he said, if anybody finds me, uh, they're going to kill me. And so we went and built a city. Well, who's going to kill him if only his parents were around? And if he's building a city, who's going to move into it? There, there, there must have been a lot of other people around. So I don't think Adam was the first person. I think Adam was the first prophet. In other words, he was the first person to be given a directive by God. And of course, we know what he did with it. So this brings us to Romans 5, which says, Sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam, who is the type of one who is to come. Now, the traditional view is that this is talking about the law being Moses' law and the Ten Commandments. I, I don't think that makes sense. What I think makes sense is this is referring to God revealing himself to Adam. And when God revealed what he wanted humanity to be, suddenly there was sin because there was a law. So what this is saying is Rog was gonking Grog on the head with a rock to kill him for a long time. And it wasn't a sin until God said, I don't want you doing that anymore. And once humanity knew that God didn't want that, then sin spread to all men through knowledge. So notice that sin is transmitted the same way as salvation by knowledge, which I think addresses a bunch of ancient theological problems like, well, what about the people who haven't heard and, and all of that? So then we have this issue of original sin. Now, I think this is a dubious term. It's not in the Bible, but it's around. So what are we going to do with it? Well, I would like to have you consider that sin is, original sin is not genetically transmitted guilt. What is it? It is inescapable knowledge of our inadequacy once our inadequacy has been revealed. Once we know it, we can't unknow it. And then we are shackled to Darwinian imperatives, which we hate. I think before God revealed himself, man didn't know to be frustrated with the competition because that's the only rules there were. But now we're stuck with these rules and we're unable to solve our problems through any human instrument, even though we long for a better world. And so I believe the Old Testament is perfectly consistent with Darwinian principles and tribal altruism and cooperation like kin selection, just like the animal kingdom, were the, and these things were the iron law before Christ. And then God revealed himself to a tribe, the Israelites, through which he would eventually eradicate tribalism itself. And I believe that God entered into contact with real tribal evolving human beings and met them on terms that they and we could understand. And then we come to the New Testament. So you have Acts chapter 2. All who believed were together and held everything in common and began selling their property and possessions and distributing the proceeds to everyone as anyone had need. That is evolution omega. And when Jesus said, the first shall be last and the last shall be first, that statement is predicated on resurrection and judgment. And so God, I believe that God has granted freedom for life itself to develop as it wishes, because that is the only way the creation can choose to embrace God. And we are in the front of the line. And so how does humankind evolve beyond Darwinian evolution? Through resurrection. And this is why the incarnation and the resurrection of Christ is central, and it's why equality was not possible before Christ. So I am very fond of Teilhard de Jardin's Omega Point, which is the idea that the cosmos is converging towards Christ. So evolution Omega is synonymous with the kingdom, which Jesus taught about. So to, to briefly summarize what 
my argument is all life has agency and it shapes what it wants to be. This creates an evolutionary universe of finite resources and competition and cooperation and choices, which I'm calling evolution alpha. God invited Adam, the first prophet, to choose the tree of life, but he chose the knowledge of good and evil instead, which shackled humanity to evolution alpha. So Jesus introduced the kingdom, eternal life, love, and equality, which is omega, and the kingdom is the most attractive idea in history, and all creation yearns for it. And I have uh, extensive reading and many references that you can go look at it evo2.org slash omega. And I'd love to take some questions now. All right, Seth, go for it. Yeah, I guess I'll go. Um, hey, thank you so much for the lecture. Uh, I, I kind of chuckled at the end uh, with Tehar de Chardin because the entire lecture, I was like, wow, this sounds a lot like Tehar de Chardin. Um, uh, I love Tehar de Chardin. So uh, that's con I say that complimentary, uh, just published a work on him, actually. So I just wanted to say, like, what was you, like, could you speak a little bit more to the parallels, maybe your journey with him? Uh, that's just, I mean, it's a very selfish thing. But since no one else wanted questions, I really would like to know. I am not a teal heart expert. Um, I kind of, I probably came to a lot of these ideas independently bef before I, I discovered him. Um, but I guess, I guess what, uh, the motivation behind this presentation is that um, the Old Testament gets a really bad rap from modern people, especially atheists and so on. And I don't think they realize that they got their ideas about how the Old Testament should be from Jesus himself. And that if we didn't have him, we wouldn't have a way to critique. You know, what, what did you do in the ancient world every spring when the roads weren't muddy anymore, you'd take your chariot down to the next village and burn it down and take all their stuff, right? And, and like, this was just normal. And this is how you survive the next winter because, and, and, and this is how cruel the ancient world is. I, I don't think people realize how Jesus transformed, and Paul, who also gets a bad rap, how both of these guys transformed the world with these incredibly powerful ideas which are not, they're not strictly speaking, logical ideas. Like, We're so going to say like, all humans are equal. So, yeah, so let's give uh, a, a, Sia a chance to ask a question with time to answer. It. Harry, great, great talk. Thanks. Uh, you know, the, the question about one of your last slides, uh, you talk about uh, humans, the end of evolution for humans. And I mean, I, one of the things I find interesting is that I, I think we've already passed biological ev evolution in humans because now all the change that we uh, undergo is not genetic, it's cultural. So we're yeah. already in that stage in a way. And, and I think that fits in well. Maybe you could comment on how that would fit in well with Jesus being, you know, and his values and his guidance being the, the driver of that kind of, you know, non-genetic evolutionary change. Oh, oh, my God. Yeah, and, and answered in one minute. <laughs> you, you know, maybe you could say that Jesus paved the way for that kind of thinking, for, for helping us to understand that our beliefs and our values could transcend the limits of, of our physical uh, finite resources. Like, I, I believe that ingenuity is limitless. Okay, I, I believe I believe that there are no finite resources. There's only a lack of ingenuity. And I think Jesus paved the way for that thinking to come. All right, thank you, Perry. Uh, so that concludes session two.